It's Chin Ups Day 2 and this time we're going to talk about medial elbow pain with chin ups. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Today is Wednesday. That means that tomorrow is Thursday. So please join us 6 a.m. for the coffee and coaches conference call. These calls have been great. They're, they're tremendous fun for me. Time just flies by. We've been going like an hour and a half, two hours on these calls and just having a blast. So grab a cup of coffee and please join us for that. Again, 6 a.m. Link will be on my professional Facebook page um, just prior to the call, about 5.30 or so. Um, so it's Wednesday, always, always tight. We got to dig right in to today's Q&A. This is apparently chin up pull up day two of, of chin up and pull up week. Got a question from Theo and Theo says, hey, I'm experiencing this, this increasing pain in the inside of my elbow. I notice it on just about any kind of gripping activity, but it comes much more severe, especially when attempting any kind of chin up or pull up. Any ideas why this might be happening? Yes. So, so Theo, I'm gonna give you the most common representation that I see um, with this circumstance, but first and foremost, what I wanna do is I wanna cue you to watch yesterday's video. So that's kind of the setup for today's vi video um, because it gave us a little bit of a background on, on what our needs are and some of the compensatory representations that we're gonna see in, in chin-ups and pull-ups as to how people actually execute these things. Um, the, the, the key element that I want you to walk away with from yesterday's video is that we gotta have external rotation range of motion to superimpose the force of internal rotation on top. So there's gonna be common compensations that are associated with the lack of shoulder range of motion that's gonna produce orientations into external rotation so we can actually still produce the, the internal rotation force. Now, here's the problem with chin-ups and pull-ups because we've got both hands fixed on the same bar. We create a constraint and that constraint reduces our ability to turn. So we have, we have cancellation of turns which result in compressive forces and compressive strategies. We see the same thing with, with barbell activities. So again, no big deal. We just need to recognize these things. But what it does then is we create situations that are, are proximal to distal and then distal to proximal. And unfortunately, your elbow is dead center. And so we're gonna have, we're gonna have this, this sort of wave effect that's gonna come down from the top and up from the bottom. So as force demands increase, what you're gonna see is you're gonna start to see these orientations, orientations into external rotation, which we need to create space. So we have to have a space where we can move and this allows us to produce internal rotation. What's gonna happen though is we orient, we're gonna drive this from the, the scapula in, in most circumstances, the humerus is gonna follow the scapula into external rotation. And then we have to produce this internal rotation situation. So, so let's pick on a muscle when we're talking proximal to distal. People don't think about pronator teres as being a proximal mus muscle, but it does attach to the medial epicondyl. So what this muscle is actually doing as you're performing your chin up is, it's producing internal rotation because it's, it's a forearm pronator. That's why they named it pronator teres, but they screwed up because it's actually attached to the, to the humerus. And what it actually does to the humerus is it twists the humerus into ER. So it's actually an ER muscle as well. And it's an elbow flexor by traditional representation. Um, so it's doing a lot of stuff, but what it's gonna do is it's actually gonna pull in that medial condyle as you're trying to drive internal rotation on top of this ER oriented position. Now, let's go distal to proximal. We fix the hand, so what the hand's gonna try to do, it's sort of like a foot being on the ground. The hand is fixed, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start to drive internal rotation with the hand proximally. And so because of our fixed hand, even if we're supinated, even if we're supinated, we're gonna to try to drive an internal rotation force. So we're gonna to try to drive pronation from the hand proximally. Now, here's the other problem. If I get a compression on the front because I'm canceling out rotational forces, so if I push my pump handle down under these circumstances to create internal pressure and, and high force, I'm gonna create a situation where I lose shoulder internal rotation. So again, down pump handle, loss of shoulder internal rotation, now I'm in compensation city. So what you're going to see then is we're going to see internal rotation compensations. So this is going to show up as back extension, traditional back extension, um, posterior lower thorax compression. You're going to see uh, increased pronation of the forearm, pronation of the hand, and then you're going to see like a shrugging action, which is actually dorsal rostral compression. And so again, we're going to see all of these substitutions start to take place. And then your poor little elbow in the middle is going to be where, where we have this point of compensation. 
well, but what if we change the hand position? Because again, if that's the constraint, let's just manipulate that. Okay, so you, you, you may have noticed that, hey, when I play with my grip a little bit, if, if I go from like a supinated or pronated grip and I go to this, this middle range, kind of a neutral grip, that, that there's a little bit of a difference. Well, any degree of supination is gonna to start to drive some external rotation orientation from distal to proximal. So from hand proximally, um, which again, that's why these parallel grips kind of help. But um, the thing that I want you to recognize is that as soon as you start to load this to any significant degree, you're still gonna drive a ton of internal rotation force. Um, one of the other advantages that's possible, which is why we, we tend to, to push people towards neutral grips so they can keep training while they're trying to rehab this situation. Um, there's a cool thing about brachial radialis in this, in this neutral grip position that, that I want to uh, point out. Everybody looks at brachial radialis and say, oh, that's an elbow flexor. And that's a really good dead guy representation um, as to what it might do. But what it actually does is it creates a posterior force um, through, the, through the elbow. And that actually decreases the, the posterior compressive strategy that actually occurs under this same situation. So we get this posterior lateral compression that drives some of this, this orientation at the elbow as well. And so the, the neutral grip can actually resolve some of that just by this cool uh, effect from brachioradialis. So let's talk solutions here real quick. So number one, we gotta rebuild posterior expansion. We've gotta have a, tr a, a true ER field that we can superimpose internal rotation upon. So the activities that we're gonna start to select here are going to be posterior expansion. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna play with arm position a little bit, so we wanna do activities that are below shoulder level. That's gonna help us start to build this, this posterior lower thorax expansion. And then we wanna be able to move through the excursion of traditional shoulder elevation um, where we're gonna start to, to move upward and, and improve our dorsal rostral expansion so we can eventually get the arm above shoulder level. Um, do, do this progressively. Don't try to do it all at once because chances are you're not gonna have enough expansion initially. Um, you might wanna also try to superimpose a little bit of, of supination into the inverted activities that you might be using that are eventually going to get you um, a little bit of pump handle and dorsal rostral expansion at the same time. If uh, you know somebody that, that has um, manual skills and is allowed to touch people, you can manually reorient the forearm. So, so we, we block the, the proximal elbow, a little bit of distraction there to reduce the, the posterior compression and then we can actually uh, mobilize that, that distal forearm to actually reduce the amount of pronation in the distal forearm relative to the proximal forearm. So that's a fun one and it does, it's, it's rather remarkable in regards to, to how quickly you can, you can see changes there. Um, then we gotta restore anterior expansion. So we gotta get true internal rotation available to us. Um, because of the, the elbow being a little uncomfortable, under many situations, we start in, a, in a, like a high oblique sit. This is a great place to start. We can keep the elbow extended. Um, I do have a video on, on YouTube um, showing a, a high oblique activity where we start to, to play with in, inhalation and exhalation. So we're, so we're actually creating um, expansion posteriorly, expansion anteriorly, and we're manipulating the pressure through the hand. So we're getting pronation, supination, ER, IR through the shoulder at the same time. So check out that video. We wanna move down then to the low oblique position where we can actually get the, the elbow flexed. In this position, because we're not pulling, we're reducing the demands on, on pronator teri. So now it can just be its, its true little dead guy self where it's becoming the pronator of the, of the forearm, which is what we want to, to restore normal proximal pronation at the elbow and start to reduce some of this, this orientation. Um, eventually what you can do then is start to build the, these orientations into some direct arm work if that's what you like to do. Um, and then I would also suggest that we move from activities where both hands are on a fixed bar to activities where we have a free moving hand and we're doing one side at a time in regards to your pulling activities because what this is gonna allow is gonna allow the normal rotations to occur so we're not getting um, symmetrical um, force production at the same time, which creates this anterior posterior compression, which got you here in the first place. So Theo, I hope that helps you a little bit and directs you in regards to your training. If you have any other questions, go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and I will see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., coffee and coaches conference call. Have a great day.